So last week as I found myself explaining dynamic systems theory to some MBA uh, assistant coaches, uh, I kind of hesitated uh, because in one sense I thought, you know, it's not really important for a coach, especially at that level, to really know the underlying theories that we use to describe motor learning. Um, but in another sense, I realized that it is good that we can describe the things that we do in practice based on a theory. So when I started to coach, I didn't know any motor learning theories. Uh, you know, I started coaching, you know, just when I started college, I really didn't take any science or learning type classes throughout my undergraduate as a literature major. Um, so I learned by doing. I started coaching. I was a head coach for almost my entire career. Um, and so I learned by trial and error. I learned by trying things and I learned by watching other people um, and taking what I thought had some value and then discarding things uh, that I didn't like. Um, so in that way, uh, in a lot of ways, my learning was atypical, but I certainly didn't learn by reading a textbook and, uh, you know, memorizing theories and then trying to apply those theories uh, to the court. Instead, I learned by trial and error, and then later when I started to pursue, uh, you know, postgraduate degrees, uh, that's when I learned the theories. And as I started to study the various theories, I saw how they connected to things that I already did on the court. So, for instance, yesterday... Um, I talked a little bit about differential learning and some of the, you know, instructions that I use and feedback that I give, uh, you know, and I use that type of feedback before I had ever heard of differential learning. Uh, you know, sm I use small-sided games uh, long before I had ever heard of, you know, the constraints-led approach to coaching. I used, you know, questioning in my coaching and tried to empower players long before I read uh, Lynn Kidman's book that really kind of put some theory or uh, you know, some uh, scientific rationale for the things that I was doing on the court. So in the one sense, you know, it's hard for me to say that a coach must know uh, the theories, but in another sense, I do think that, that there is some value in knowing that what I do on the court is supported by actual uh, theory and not just hand me down, this is what we always do type of knowledge. Uh, you know, I was reading, I'm reading a book uh, right now about baseball and in it, uh, you know, the analytics guys and the managers are going back and forth about the value of a closer or what's the best way to use a closer. And the manager goes, a closer is a closer is a closer. Uh, and the analytics guy points out, well, yeah, but we lost the game in the seventh inning when their three best hitters came up and they scored four runs. And so then we never put our closer in the game because we were losing, so it wasn't a safe situation. So... What's right, the traditional approach where closers only throw the ninth inning in safe situations or the more analytical approach where, uh, you know, you use your best relief pitcher in the most high leverage situation. So, uh, you know, I would tend to favor the analytics viewpoint. Um, I do kind of understand the kind of cultural aspect of a closer and only using them in safe situations. But, you know, if, if the goal is to get the best performance from our team or to put our team in the best opportunity to win. I think using the closer in the high leverage situation is probably best. Um, so there's two, two viewpoints. Um, and so I, I can see both of them, but I also feel comfortable as a coach knowing that some of what I do or most of what I do on a court is supported by some research uh, and some theoretical basis. Um, and so on top of that then, when I find something that has no theoretical basis, uh, you know, it starts to make me question whether this thing that everybody does is valid. If we can't support it with some kind of uh, scientific rationale or some kind of theory, it's basically just, you know, essentially superstition or tradition passed down from coach to coach, uh, you know, which is more important? Is, is the traditional side, closer is a closer is a closer, how much value does that have versus something that's actually supported by science or math or some type of rigorous or semi-rigorous study. Uh, and so when I think about this, some of the things that uh, I describe as fake fundamentals to me are things that are tradition that I haven't been able to find uh, or support with any information outside of tradition. Uh, whether it's science, math, theories, motor learning, 
kinesiology, physiology, whatever the case may be. Uh, so if, if I can't find something to support this thing that is very important because of tradition, personally I discard it. And so while my basis, while I started learning through trial and error, through doing, uh, you know, at this point, I've discarded most things um, in coaching that don't have some kind of underlying theory that can support them. And it's not as though I got rid of these things because of the theory. In most cases, I stopped doing them long before I realized the theoretical basis. Something like the three-man weave is a drill that I've never done as a coach. I've coached for over 20 years. I've never done as a coach. Um, because I don't think the tradition that supports it really, uh, I don't think it has merit in the ways that we talk about it from a traditional standpoint. It improves passing. How? You know, I, I, I don't buy that uh, explanation because uh, if you look at all the variables involved in passing, a uh, three-man wave has almost none of them involved in the drill. So to me, there are much better ways to practice passing. Um, and not only is that my viewpoint, but if we look at things in terms of specificity of practice or task representation, uh, you know, complexity uh, in learning, all these kinds of concepts and theories would support a different drill uh, as opposed to something like a three-man weave. Um, and so to me, I look very hard at those things uh, that are traditional. Um, and in most cases, if I can't find rationale for using them in practice, uh, that's what I term a fake fundamental. Uh, you know, the mile run test is another one, or two mile run test. It's tradition. Physiological speak, physiologically speaking, uh, it's not a good test of basketball performance. It doesn't align to what goes on in a basketball game or on the basketball court, um, both in terms of movement specificity, but also in terms of energy systems. So why do we do it? Tradition. To me, fake fundamental. Um, I think more... Uh, you know, we need to bring the theory into practice and then also the practice into theory. So, if, so again, you know, I came about this, um, like most coaches, through a trial and error learning, through learning through experience, learning from others. Um, but now I see how most of what I kind of came to naturally or organically um, really is supported by science. And so things that I find uh, that have no kind of scientific rationale. Those are things that I really question. And if I can't find that underlying reason, I continue to discard. I continue to get rid of things. Um, if I can find something that maybe I think is, you know, a questionable drill or a questionable practice, but there's some scientific rationale for doing it, then maybe I, I keep it uh, in my repertoire, even though I'm not 100% uh, in favor of, you know, the drill or the activity. So, uh, again, I think... You know, I don't think the coaches should be guided or dictated by theory, but I also think it's important that we do start to understand a little bit of theory and we, and we can see some rationale for what we do beyond just uh, the tradition or that's what we've always done or that's how I do it. Um, but there is some rationale beyond this, um, whether it's supported by science or really a, a strong grounding in uh, practical experience.